Any questions in the down at the front here? First of all, I should put my glasses on so I can see the rest. If you could just say who you are and uh, who you represent. Uh, I'm Peter Staley from the uh, Australian Dairy Products Federation and Australian Truffle Growers. Um, a question to Andy. Have you ever considered doing a, uh, a, an evaluation of the cost effectiveness of your electronic biosensors with good old fashioned technology like a well trained dog? Well, the, obviously, the, the technology rests or fails based on the fact that it, it, it is more cost effective to run than the whole process of having to train dogs up in, in, a, in a highly specific way. So yeah, the whole business model is built around the fact that it should be much more cost effective to use those biosensors and that you'll be able to adapt them much more quickly to a whole range of different tasks in the field. Thank you. Uh, Will Zachman, Biosecurity SA, for Andy and Andreas, I suppose. Uh, the challenges are big enough trying to release a virus into the environment. Andy, it would seem that the gene drive technology is really taking off, but we are so far behind in a regulatory framework sense and a social licence to operate. How are we going to catch that up? So. Um this is one of the, I mean, the thing about technology is technology is never, never the limiting factor, right? You, the technologies are coming of, 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 be they genetic, be they ICT, they're coming into our lives at a very fast rate. The big challenge is around uh, ensuring that we have a license to operate, that we can use them uh, to, to generate the benefits we know they can generate. So you're absolutely right, Will, that's, that's the big challenge. I would be very surprised if permission we were given for a gene drive system to be released in the field in, within the next 20 years. But that doesn't mean that we can't still develop the regulatory processes and the safety aspects of it to be able to, to achieve that and, 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 you know, just like rabbit biocontrol has done, generate benefits that will be for the very long term, particularly as much in a conservation environment as in an agricultural environment, and be able to manage problems that up to now have been unmanageable. Can I just add to that, and if we, if we just look at experience, um, in the lead up to the release of mixed mitosis in the 30s, there was a lot of public opposition, there was a lot of fear, uncertainty, and they were, you know, that delayed the release by years, but those issues were gradually worked through, and we now have a, you know, a target specific, extremely effective biocontrol agent. So, so the, 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 the social challenge associated with gene drives is not, you know, without precedent, and, and biocontrol is a, a good example. I mean, let's, sorry, I was just going to say CRISPR-Cas9 now is pretty much accepted in the medical industry mm. as a way of cutting and manipulating genomes to help save lives and treat cancer, and it's starting to be used also in the food industry. Um, gene drive is, if you're going to use CRISPR in a gene drive system, you've got to start by targeting a system that everybody agrees has to be targeted uh, as, a, as a way of, you know, a clear way of getting public buy-in. So if we had a, a gene drive system that we could use that we would guarantee could take out cane toads, we might get Australia, all of Australia behind us, right? Mm. Um, but but um, um, you need a system in which you're going to get, you're, you, you can, you're sure to get the public support in what you're trying to do. Just developing that point about the, the application of the technology, it might start with looking at, say, as a project with the invasive animal CRC on fertility controls of pest animals. So to work through to a proof of concept and say, well, the science can do it, but there is constraint, that constraint may be, well, it won't work with pest animals, but it has a real application for a welfare issue of spaying cattle in northern Australia, where it's in a controlled environment. So it's the same as Andy's point, the technology may actually be better deployed in some other area. Uh, Bruce Christie, New South Wales DPI. Uh, just to follow on from the CRISPR, uh, obviously a cane toad uh, in our situation is a much maligned creature and we don't like it much, but somebody must love it somewhere in the rest of the world. And if you put something in the gene that's going to take out the cane toad in Australia, 
how are you going to protect those cane toads that live quite happily somewhere else in their own environment? Well, of course, I mean, one of the requirements of, of a gene drive system is that the whole population has to be interacting and, and reproducing sexually. I don't, so, so, yes, you would have to deal with the fact that somebody might carry a cane toad from northern Australia back to Central America and that it then affect the native population. But, the, I mean, the, as I say, all of the effort now around thinking about great gene drive technology is around understanding those risks and understanding what we can do with the technology to be able to deploy it in a safe way. And that's where the, the, the research is still at an early phase. Well, I've got a question for you, Cameron. Um, you mentioned integrated management, so biocontrol agents, animal management, pasture management, tactical use of fertiliser, tactical use of herbicides are all tools out there. Why are weeds still a problem? Is it just us, people? The humans in the system are one part of the, uh, of the issue. And around the, what I call the geographical context, because there's so many combinations. As I say we have skilled producers and capable to implement a range of these control processes. They know how to put it all together. Others may not. But recognising that those particular weeds in a different context, like the rangelands versus the middle of Victoria, the challenge is, again, how do I put the various tools together? And I think, as Andy's touched on, we are not short of technologies, but it's actually the deployment which is, which is the key. And where we have this constant challenge back onto our production systems, because of things like the breeding and the seeding, we need to be quite Basically, it's being diligent to know this is a game plan for 10 years where there is no seeding in that particular paddock. With the vagaries around climate seasons, basically, and as I said, people get busy, competition resources. I don't have cash this year. And that's where all good plans run amok. And hence, the constant pressure back on the production system means always these weeds are there. The opportunity from bike control is that as I said, it turns the table back onto those target species. Question just here. Thanks. Uh, Carmel Kerwick, Biosecurity Queensland. Um, I'm just wondering about the gene drive technology. Um, that has to be species specific. Like, it won't work for feral cats or foxes. Um, it'll only work for species that, um, like rabbits, that are the quite you know, socially close. Because I can't well, see it, how it... No, it doesn't require a social environment because it's not like a disease or like, or like um, Khaleesi virus that gets spread between individuals. It just, it, it just operates within a sexually reproducing population. So in theory, you could use it for cats, though cats have a relatively long generation time, which means it would take a long time to drive it into the whole population. Of course, the issue with cats is that, you know, um, cats get moved around, right? They get... Uh, they get, they get trans, transported around the world, so the risks associated with being able to contain your gene drive would be a lot, he, lot harder. Is there a way of working out how many of the population catch and how many are going to so, so, Well, the practicality is, is if, if you've got a gene drive system that's 100% efficient, you only need to introduce one, one individual into the population with the construct and weight. Depend, yeah, depending on, depending on the reproductive rate of your target organism. Yeah. Just to follow up to that one for my Andy. Uh, there is a risk around hybridisation too. If a, if a species, target species, actually mates with another species, isn't there? Or is there a risk around hybridisation between, between well, species? It, wherever you get gene flow, then there is a risk, yes. So you need to very, very closely understand gene flow. So one of the... One of the, area, one of the um, uh, well, there are two target areas that gene drive is being considered by, um, particularly by island conservation, as a way of dealing with really uh, complex conservation issues. Is one is, as I mentioned, is um, can can we use gene drives to eliminate mosquitoes from Hawaii? And why do we want to el eliminate mosquitoes from Hawaii? First, because all of the mosquitoes in Hawaii are introduced. They're all exotics. They tend to be um, um, disease-carrying mosquitoes because they're the ones that get moved around the world. And it is mosquitoes that are transmitting avian uh, malaria 
from the exotic birds at sea level into the native bird populations and wiping them out in, in Hawaii. So the only way you can save Hawaiian native birds is to, or one of the key ways would be to take out the mosquitoes and gene drives provides an opportunity to do that. Obviously the, the gene drive is contained with the, the mosquito. As the mosquito population goes into decline through its effectiveness, then the, the number of, of, your, of your gene drive constructs in the environment are, are less, therefore the risk declines and the benefit you get to your native bird population increases. So that's one example, for example, where, where um, you know, the, 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 the collective benefits of the approach um, uh, are uh, being, being recognised across multiple organisations. Andy, Gavin Ash from University of Southern Queensland. Um, will a gene drive ever go extinct? It'll only go extinct if the organism you're target, go, targeting goes extinct. Unless you, as I say, there are ways of designing gene drives. So at the moment the whole bundle is packaged together. You've got the CRISPR, which is like your scissors, as I showed. You've got the, the, um, the, the, the guide RNA, which tells you where on the genome you want to cut. And then you've got the payload, which is the bad gene package you attach, all right? If you put all that in together and you introduce it into the, into the population, then effectively, it, and, and it's very successful, it'll only die out when the last individual dies out. But there are two ways around that. One is you can break those components into separate entities on different chromosomes, which means they actually have a temporary life because they only, can only come together for a certain number of generations. Or the alternative, which is even more controversial, is that you actually have an antidote gene drive that you drive out into the system afterwards to wipe it out. The possibilities are endless once you can play with, with genomes to the nth degree and to, the, to that level of precision. So we are getting close to, uh, to the end of 3.30, so uh, I do thank the three speakers uh, today. It was very, very interesting. I think gene drive is going to be something we're going to talk about maybe for the next 20 years, if that's <laughs> the, the way. Yeah. Uh, I do thank you, and I wish uh, you'd join me in thanking the three speakers today. Thanks very much.